This is the story of a C-17 from the 437th Airlift Wing. The C-17 is a massive beast. It can carry insane amounts of cargo. And wait, wait, I'm being told that that's not a C-17. That's the Chinese Y-20. This is a C-17. Ugh, I must have gotten my images mixed up. It's so weird that they look so similar. I wonder why. Well, back to what I was saying. The C-17 can carry cargo. A lot of it. During the pandemic, NATO used C-17s to transport 100,000 protective suits, and the Indians used their C-17s to transport cryogenic trucks full of oxygen from around the world. If you need a lot of something sent somewhere, chances are the C-17 can do it. But somehow this plane can operate from very short runways. Runways that don't even need to be paved. A C-17 can operate on gravel strips and even snow. I'll stop now before this starts sounding like an advertisement for the C-17. On the 23rd of January 2012, the C-17 would meet her match. The plane was to fly from Al Udeed Air Base in Qatar to the Forward Operating Base or FOB Shank in Afghanistan, with a stopover in Kuwait. When the plane was on the ground at Kuwait, the crew took on 100,000 pounds or 50 tons of cargo and 50,000 pounds or 22 tons of fuel. The plane left Kuwait bound for Shank and the flight was normal, nothing out of the ordinary. At 6.13 a.m. Zulu time, the pilots went over their landing briefing. They went over things like threats, weather, notices, etc. They planned to use runway 34 right, which was 6,800 feet long, and for this runway, they'd need all of the available runway. But they had a problem. Their landing speed was higher than their VBO speed. The VBO speed was the highest speed at which they could use maximum braking. If they used maximum brakes before they dropped down to the VBO speed, they could really damage their brakes. So, once on the ground, they'd have to slow down to their VBO speed, and then they could use max brakes. This meant that they'd need more runway. Space was already at a premium. As they got closer, they did their checklists. They'd be landing 20 knots faster than their VBO speed and according to their calculations, they'd need about 6,000 feet of runway. They radioed in, letting ATC know that they were planning on using the entire runway. The controller said that they could use all of the runway if needed, but it would have to be at the pilot's discretion. There was some equipment near the runway, and ATC did not have a clear view of that. As ATC worked to clear all of that up, the C-17 began its descent from 27,000 feet. The controller was unsuccessful in moving all of the equipment near the runway. They could use the entire runway, but like I said before, it would have to be at the discretion of the pilots. The pilots discussed this among themselves, and they decided that they'd make an approach, and if anything looked out of the ordinary, then they'd just go around. The giant plane lined up. ATC came on the frequency just to remind them that they couldn't see the entire runway, and that using the entire runway would be at the pilot's discretion. The pilots acknowledged. The runway came into view. The runway was covered by patches of snow. Here's a quote from the first officer. I've got the runway in sight. Swell. So it looks like the landing zone is black and little pieces of white. End quote. Braking action on the partly snow-covered runway would be less than ideal. Another thing that the crew had to contend with. The plane touched down, and they deployed the spoilers, the reversers, and the brakes. But something was wrong. This plane wasn't slowing down as expected. They tried their best, but they couldn't get their speed to drop fast enough, and they really needed to slow down. The end of the runway was getting quite close. 20 seconds after landing, the plane went off the end of runway 34 right. The plane finally came to rest 700 feet from the end of the runway. The nose gear was destroyed, the plane was on its belly, but all on board were safe. The plane was in one piece. Well, kind of. This allowed the investigators to study the plane extensively. As one team studied the plane, another team took readings of the environment. They'd need that later. In the meantime, they looked through the maintenance history of the plane and the people that worked on it. They looked through the hydraulic system and the fuel system to see if anything had failed, but all of it looked good. Then, a write-up in the unscheduled maintenance history of the plane caught their eye. Brake number 11 was serviced one day before the accident. A failed brake system would explain a plane not being able to stop in time. A recovery team decided to take a look at brake number 11 to see if it was working, 
And it was. This was not the cause of the crash. The rest of the plane checked out too. The reversers were deployed, the spoilers were armed, and the brakes were activated. This plane should have been able to stop on this runway. They eventually worked their way to the mission computer that held all of the important data that the pilots entered for the flight. As they went through the data, they noticed something known as an RCR value. RCR stands for Runway Conditions Reading. The RCR value is a measure of the amount of friction between the runway and the plane's tires. A value less than 23 meant that braking action was degraded. On that day, the RCR value was measured to be 12, which meant that braking action was very much degraded. The flight computer calculated the plane's stopping distance as 4,457 feet. This was with the RCR value at 23. With the RCR value at 12, their stopping distance exceeded the runway length. The plane was fine. It just landed on too short a runway. So why did the computer end up calculating the landing distance with the wrong value? Had it been given the correct value, the computer would have told them that the runway was too short. The short answer? The computer used what the pilots gave it. There are measures to prevent the use of incorrect data. In the approach checklist, they had a section called the TOLD section. TOLD stands for takeoff landing data. It's where they check stuff like the RCR values. But they missed the RCR value during that check. So they did not know that the runway was too short for their plane. On top of that, the captain failed to have a briefing about the VBO landing distance, which should have been done. That might have helped them catch their error, but nope, it was not done. Then, as they were getting closer to the runway, ATC told them that runway braking was degraded, and the first officer did try to update the RCR value in the computer, but failed to do so. Here's an excerpt from the cockpit conversation. The captain said, Clear to land, expect poor to fare, he said, referring to the ATC. The first officer, in response to this, said, I'm going to go ahead and give us a 12 on that, referring to the RCR value. But the first officer never changed the values. So, what would have happened had the first officer changed the value? Well, pilots are required to verbalize their landing distance on the approach briefing. If the first officer had entered an RCR value of 12, the computer would have calculated a landing distance greater than the available runway, and the computer just wouldn't show the landing distance on the display. When the pilot did not see the landing distance, they would have known that something was wrong. The investigators programmed a simulator with data from that day. When the RCR value was set to 23, the landing distance was displayed. This told the pilots that they could land. When they changed the RCR to 12, the landing distance vanished. When they checked the landing distances the computer had calculated, the VBO landing distance came to 8,600 feet. This was way in excess of the runway at Shank. This runway was just too small. Mission replanning is very important, especially in the context of the military. Your mission will throw curveballs at you, and you have to roll with the punches. In this case, the landing conditions were different to the ones that they were expecting, and they just could not adapt in time. One thing that I like about military reports is that they go into the financial aspect of things. Civilian reports usually don't. So, pause the video right now, go into the comments, and guess how much it cost to repair this plane. I'll wait. Are you done? It cost $69.4 million to fix this plane. How close was your guess? Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.